it's like uh, not only did he keep sleeping on a couch, but they never had sex, right? They never were intimate with each other. And this went on. She, she eventually said, we really should go and see somebody about our marriage. And he was like, no, we don't need to see anybody. We'll figure it out. And uh, um, she did this several times. And finally, she was like, I'm done because we're not figuring this out. And you don't want to go see anybody. Um, so he came and saw me. And I was like, oh. Well, I guess you should have gone and seen somebody when she said you needed to, right? It's your task as husband. If Audra says, oh, we need to go talk to Pastor Schultz about this because we just are not seeing eye to eye, then, then you are the one that calls me and says, hey, Audra and I need to come and see you, right? That's just, men are, men are idiots. <laughs> men are idiots and incredibly selfish. Just incredibly selfish, right? I, again, what I want, how I want, when I want, and if my wife doesn't give that to me I can walk away and and now women are empowered to do the same thing right there was a day where women weren't empowered to do that at all um, now women are empowered to do the same thing so if my husband doesn't give me what I want when I want how I want then I can go find somebody who will um, and it's just a sad state of affairs my uh, my parents um, are married for I think 36 years my father and my mother both uh, not as bad as my father, but my dad was an alcoholic. Uh, you know, well, I'm not even going into all of the stories because there's just too many that are most people don't know. But anyway, after bailing him out of jail and wrecking the last truck, she said she told him to leave that she couldn't do it anymore and she filed for a divorce because it beat her yeah. yeah so you have to be safe so you have to be safe mm -hmm. but but even in those situations god does not desire divorce yeah he doesn't he does not desire divorce um and uh and that's a tough thing because we have um, really divorce on demand and no fault divorce, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, assets are just split. It's super easy. Um, very few, very few places the judge even um, mandates counseling or anything like that anymore. It's just uh, you want a divorce, here you go. Um, if you really want to be nasty about it, you hire lawyers that uh, try to uh, impugn the other person so that you get more, right? But, um, but it's just... Um, it's not God's desire. So even in a tough situation, right, you have to be safe, right? God doesn't say, well, stay un under the roof, right? Uh, but, um, but God desires that that would be worked out and worked through and that um, the couple can come back together again, right? It's just um, uh, the only reason that Jesus gives for divorce is uh, for sexual unfaithfulness. That's what that uh, passage so that, means. That is a... I didn't know that that was... Sexual unfaithfulness. Um, because because your spouse has left. But, Paul would say, Paul says, which is Jesus, right? Because it's all God's word, right? So God says through Paul, but you should remain single so that if your husband comes back to you, you can reconcile mm -hmm. Which is really fascinating. Um, I have uh, just about every divorce that I've had as a pastor, uh, not divorce Please. members Please. that I've had as a pastor. Um, most of them are engaged to somebody before the divorce is even finalized. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, oh my gosh, maybe you should wait a little while before you introduce somebody new to the family, why don't you wait a while and deal with the fallout with your kids? Because kids are not resilient. Yeah. Kids are affected by divorce all their lives. They did a, there was a longitudinal study of divorced kids and like 25 years later, they all were si significantly impacted. It's why, um, it's why kids of divorced parents have a 50% higher rate of divorce because it significantly impacts them throughout life. It's, it's really wow. crazy. Um, 
my two boys, uh, they're a few years and then um, Michelle. Um, neither of them have girlfriends and they're in their 40s. And have and as far as we know, they have not, not left uh, people behind, little people, and they are, as far as I know, they are quite content in that. Yeah, commitment phobes. Could be, but yeah. that's because Probably. their father left them yeah. when yep. they were. Seven right. and ten. It affects, it affects kids all the way through. So don't get divorced. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I've done it twice, and I said I, I, I'm not, I'm not getting married again. I can't. Um, it's. Uh, yeah. At this point in my life, I don't have that much time left. I want to spend it with my children. Correct. I don't need somebody else. To that's correct. And besides God loves you. Alright, seventh commandment, don't steal. Eighth commandment, don't uh I don't know, don't don't tell lies about your neighbor, betray him, slander him, hurt his reputation, defend him, speak well of him, explain everything in the kindest way. It's kind of falls again back on the fourth commandment, right? I mean, right, uh, so you don't uh um, just because Pastor Schultz says something or aggravates you or whatever, right? You don't go to other members and say, oh, I can't believe that Pastor Schultz, blah, 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 right? Because now not only are you breaking the Eighth Commandment, but breaking the Fourth <laughs> Commandment too, because I'm your spiritual uh, um, father. Uh, so, so um, uh, yeah, don't get caught up in the Eighth Commandment. The Eighth Commandment is, I think, one of the easiest ones for adults to break because we do it in just such casual conversation we end up talking about somebody or in a, in a negative way it doesn't mean that you can't talk about people it's just you need to really always be on guard as to how you talk about people um, and uh, um, and then not be sucked into um, somebody else complaining about someone right so so if uh, if uh, if somebody comes to uh, Darren and says oh Pastor Schultz, blah, 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 right? A lot of Christians think that Darren's only responsibility is to say, oh, no, no, you need to go talk to Pastor Schultz, and I don't need, I'm not going to listen to that, right? I think that's false. I don't think that's Darren's only responsibility. I think Darren's responsibility is, oh, uh, you need to talk to Pastor Schultz and not me, and I'll let Pastor know that you're coming to see him. And then Darren needs to come and tell me that so-and-so has a problem. I think that's your Christian responsibility. I just can't... Um, I've been teaching that for a long time, and I can't, I can't see any other path for that along the Eighth Commandment. Because, um, because human nature, right? If you tell somebody, go talk to Pastor Schultz, what are they not going to do? They're not going to come talk to Pastor Schultz. And they'll just find somebody else to listen to their complaining. How about this, though? I think a lot of times when there is conflict between two people, it's people who are speaking across purposes or don't understand what they're talking about. Uh, absolutely. And in that situation, if somebody comes and they are complaining about something, and this happens in a lot of situations. Happens in, in business workplaces all and, the time. And, and I've been in a leadership position for a long time yep. at my company, and there are so many times I see friction. Yep. And... I try to uh, provide more of an outside yep. observation, and I, a lot of times it will change things so that that person actually wants to go talk. Yep. Bring their. And I think you can do that in a godly way. You just have to be careful, right? I mean, but if you're if your intent is to bring reconciliation, mm -hmm. then I think that you can do that in a godly way, right? It's not godly to sit and listen, right, right and right. say, well. Go back to work, right? <laughs> that's true. That's that's <laughs> not right because now you've listened. You haven't put anything in the best way. Yeah. You haven't explained the context of the situation. You haven't brought greater understanding. You haven't done anything that you should do as a supervisor. 
in a leadership role, et cetera. All right, I've only listened and then I said, okay, well, thanks for coming in right. um, and sharing, <laughs> I guess. Right, no, I totally, agree. I totally agree with that. It totally can be done in a, in a proper way. The other, the other thing I think that's um, necessary sometimes too, especially if it's, especially if it's somebody in a leadership position, right? So somebody's upset at Pastor Schultz. The for whatever reason, right? I mean, I don't know. I uh, people are scared of pastors sometimes, and. Um, it's a lot of anxiety, right? It's way easier to complain to somebody else than to actually go and talk to pastor about the complaint. So kudos to this family on Sunday morning that, you know, um, a little too heatedly reamed me out, but, um, <laughs> but, but kudos to them for not just going away bat mad, leaving the church, mm -hmm. or talking about me behind my back, right? I mean, uh, kudos to them that they respect me enough that this was wrong and this is what you did and blah 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 um right so so what else what the other thing that uh, and that's why you know so and so you need to talk to so and so uh, and i'll tell them that you're coming i could even go with you if you wanted to sometimes that's a necessary thing also and i think people in leadership positions a lot of times see that too right i i will um i have often um done that is to say okay Gotcha, but let's bring the other person in. Um, I mean, you do that. In, I do that with marriage counseling all, all the time. Um, you don't just sit and listen to one person, mm -hmm. um, right? We need to we need to do counseling together, not separately. Um, <clears throat> maybe a little bit separately, but we don't do counsel. I don't do counseling separately because counseling separately doesn't get at any issues or or anything. It's just it's just anybody. one person complaining about the other one. Right, so, so if you want to come and talk to me and ask me what you can do to be a better husband, all over that, we can we can counsel without your wife, absolutely. But for you to come in and say, well, this is bad and this is bad, and she does this and she does this and this is bad, and we're not connecting here, and we're not we're not we're not she's not she's not. Yeah, I, no, I think uh, I'm glad I know all of that. So now let's bring Audra in and let's talk about this together, right? And I think in in uh, supervisory roles, leadership roles, it's a lot of times the same thing too, right? It's how do I bring resolution to mm -hmm. the conflict between the two because I'm the supervisor, right? And so pastors do that in counseling and um, supervisors do it in whatever you call that, mm -hmm. um, team meetings, mm -hmm. um, or whatever. And then ninth and tenth commandment is not coveting. And coveting is really <clears throat> coveting is really just all about um, wanting things that God hasn't given to you to have, right? Uh, being satisfied with what God has blessed you with, um, or what He hasn't blessed you with. And um, uh, so, con coveting is really a, uh, I think, a lot about contentment. Um, uh, but then coveting is, you know, the gateway. It's the gateway, right? I mean. Um, because you can covet and break the sixth commandment, you can covet and break the seventh commandment, you can covet and break the eighth commandment as you trash somebody else, you can covet and break the fifth commandment by causing hurt or harm to your neighbor, right? I mean, coveting is really kind of the gateway, gateway commandment to a lot of the other ones. Not that you need coveting to turn to the other ones, but uh, coveting definitely, definitely, uh, uh, or I should say, you know, if you break the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth commandment, you quite possibly are breaking the ninth or tenth commandment too, and then definitely the first one, right? All right. Any questions on the commandments? It's a little longer than I often spend on those, but I think it's good. We we're kind of in that world today. So the next page, the next page, we'll just do this because we already sort of talked about it last week. Um, Sort of, but not. So, um, confession, absolution, and I have it here. <clears throat> I have it here because it con after the commandments, right? So after the law, right? The mirror of the law shows us our sin, and and so so the mirror of the law shows us our sin and and uh, seeks to turn us back to Christ. And so <clears throat> this is a useful place in the catechism. Confession, absolution comes between baptism and the Lord's Supper because. It's a means of grace, and we'll talk about it later on also as a means of grace. But 
In this book, it's after the Ten Commandments because that's the that's the idea. The mirror of the law says, "Turn back to the Lord." Repent means to turn, and uh, confess means to speak the truth that God speaks about your sin. So God says your sin is sin and abject and horrific and so when I confess confess means to agree with God to speak with God on whatever it is so uh, the confession of faith right when we do the Apostles Creed Nicene Creed we confess the faith we're speaking with God about himself so as God speaks about himself I also speak I believe in God the Father Son and Holy Spirit um, so we confess the faith, we speak with God about um, what he says about himself. When we confess our sins, we speak with God about what he says about my sin. And what he says about my sin is, do not covet, do not commit adultery, do not murder, right, cause hurt or harm to your neighbor, whatever, whatever the commandment is that I've broken, I confess that. So I not only turn back to Jesus for help in this time of need, but then I confess it, I speak the truth about my sin back to God. This is what I have done wrong. And so uh, we do that in church. There's different ways that you can confess your sins. You can do it privately um, in your bed at night or, or with uh, family, whatever, however you do it. Um, when you pray the Lord's Prayer and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive, right? We are confessing. You're confessing your sins at that point. Um, nothing real specific, but in a general way, you're confessing your sins. You may, you may, uh, at, in bed at night, you may say, "Yeah, I've done this and this and this and this. I'm sorry for those, Lord." On Sunday, um, we do a. Um, uh, oh, you can also do private confession by going to a priest um, or a pastor and confessing your sins um, in private with a priest or a pastor. Um, you can also confess your sins privately to the person that you've wronged. So um, if um, we'll pick on Audra, Audra yells at uh, Darren and recognizes that she's yelled at him. Uh, Audra says, I'm sorry uh, for that. And Audra confesses her sins to Darren. So we confess our sins uh, privately in all of those kinds of ways. Um, but then we also practice corporate confession where the, the family of faith, the body of Christ, confesses their sin together. So, um, and the, uh, the, the purpose of that is so that uh, we understand that we are all in the same boat, right? There is nobody better than anybody on Sunday morning when we gather together. All of us are sinful and, and uh, deserve nothing but God's wrath and eternal punishment. And so um, we also typically don't just make up our own words uh, for that corporate confession. There are specific corporate confessions that we use that are all sort of the same. And, and the reason that we use um, kind of um, words out of the hymnal, right, words out of the divine service, is because they're tailored to be sort of all-encompassing. And what I mean by that is, if you look at this page where it says confession, most merciful God, uh, we confess that we are by nature, and you see the box and the arrow, right, original sin, that's our nature is, is sinful, and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. So, thought, word, and deed, by what we've done, our committed sins and undone, omitted sins, those are all of our actual sins. So not only do we have the original sin, but now we have the actual sin. We, all of our sin is done right there. Um, by nature, we're sinful and unclean. Our thoughts, words, and deeds by what we've done and undone, all sinful. And then we have not loved you with our whole heart. That's the first table of the law, commandments 1, 2, and 3. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, commandments 4 through 10, second table of the law. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment for, uh, right, speaking, uh, confessing, speaking the truth about our sin with God. We, God says you deserve um, present and eternal punishment, and we agree with God. Because that's what God's word says. Because of your sin, this is what you deserve. And so we agree with God, and we speak um, with God on the truth of our sin. So we deserve this. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and renew us, lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. So help me 
not only forgive my sins, but help me to walk in that newness of life that you've given to me in holy baptism. Help me to walk in that newness of life that um, the third use of the law as a guide, right? Help guide me by your law so that I might delight in your will and walk in your ways. And then the absolution, it's all gospel, right? That's all law. Um, we deserve punishment. Um, but the good news that your pastor then speaks to you, whether you uh, meet with your pastor privately or um, in this corporate confession, um, the pastor then speaks the words of Jesus to you as the called and ordained servant of Christ in this place. The pastor has the authority, John 20, to forgive your sins or to retain your sins if you're not sorry for those sins. And so the pastor says, Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word and in this place of, in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. And Martin Luther writes in the Catechism that you can be just as certain that uh, when the pastor speaks that way, um, it's just as if Jesus were dealing with us himself. And so that's the absolution. Um, and, uh, and you receive that absolution from the pastor, either corporately on Sunday morning or privately if you come and talk to the pastor. Um, but you also receive that forgiveness of Jesus um, through the certainty of Scripture. So when you're, when you're in bed at night and you uh, say, Lord, I'm really sorry for these sins, please forgive me. Uh, well, you don't have to lie awake for hours and hours and hours wondering if God actually forgives you because the promise of Scripture is that He forgives you. Um, 1 John 1, 8 and 9, um, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and forgives our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from me. Right? The promise of Scripture is that when you ask, your sins are forgiven. Um, when your wife sins against you and says, I'm sorry, and Darren says, I forgive you because you never say, it's all right, don't worry about it, blah, blah, blah. No, we don't. Sin is not all right. Um, sin needs to be forgiven. So when Darren says, I forgive you, you're actually pronouncing God's forgiveness. And, and that's why it's so important for people to say, I forgive you, because when you just say, it's okay, or don't worry about it, no problem, better luck next time, whatever it is, you're actually denying that person God's forgiveness. Because you, as a Christian brother or sister in Christ, are actually speaking God's forgiveness to that person. So it's incredibly important for people to say, I forgive you, when, you say, when somebody says, I'm sorry. Now I think every once in a while, somebody doesn't really sin against you and they say, oh, I'm sorry. Right? It's like, yeah, that's okay, because I didn't really count that as a sin. So there are some times where I don't actually say I forgive you to people. If they say, oh, I forgot to do that, I'm sorry. It's like, did they really sin against me? Uh, probably not, right? I have to kind of think about that in my head sometimes. It's like, do I have to forgive them or is it okay? So sometimes it's okay because they didn't really sin. Right? But that's the idea. Um, <clears throat> anytime that forgiveness comes, whether it's through the assurance of the word through the mutual conversation of the brothers, right? That's what that's called when you forgive each other. Mutual conversation of the brothers. Or if it's through the pastor with individual confession, uh, private confession, or if it's the, through the pastor for corporate confession. All of that is God's forgiveness. The difference is, is that it's different modes, right? The, the forgiveness comes in different modes. So when the when you just say, I'm sorry for my sins, and I know this, I know that you forgive me because Scripture says so. Jesus doesn't say, I forgive you, right? You don't hear the words. You don't hear the words. And, and sometimes sin can still trouble you. Um, so, um, or when, uh, when uh, Audra sins against you, and I say, and you say, I forgive you. And, and she's like, ah, does he really forgive me? I'm not sure. I mean, I really hurt him. Does he really forgive me? Right? There can be uncertainty. When, when, you, <clears throat> when you're thinking about the forgiveness that God promises in his word, when you're thinking about the forgiveness that someone else gives you, um, you can be, you, you can kind of <clears throat> wonder about that forgiveness. But, but, when the pastor says, your sins are forgiven, there's no doubt 
I don't. I mean, ultimately, really, there's no doubt because Scripture says it. But sometimes Satan gets in there and causes us to doubt. But you don't have to doubt because you hear the words of Jesus from the mouths of Pastor Schultz or Pastor Ada, the very words of Jesus saying, "Your sins are forgiven." You believe it, and you don't despair, and you don't doubt it because your sins are forgiven. It's a very, very important. Um, Roman Catholics, Roman Catholics understand that. They just don't do the corporate confession. Um, as much as the individual confession. We do more corporate confession and less individual confession. But um, but the Roman Catholics would say the same thing, right? That your sins are forgiven because the, the priest, the man of God, says that they're forgiven. And he is speaking for Jesus. Uh, Roman Catholics and Lutherans are very um, unique in that way. Most other Christians do not, um, uh, they don't do confession absolution. The pastor doesn't ever absolve anybody their sins um, and they would not see it as um, the church having that authority um, they would just say, say that John 20 um, when Jesus breathes on his disciples and says um, all um, uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me um, no breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive anyone their sins they're forgiven and if you do not forgive them they are not forgiven um, other Christians just believe that that's given to all Christians that verse in chapter 20 of John's Gospel is given to the Apostles as the church and we know it's given to the Apostles as the church because Jesus says if you forgive their sins they're forgiven if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. A Christian does not have the right to not forgive someone. When Audra sins against Darren and says, I'm sorry, Darren cannot say, I don't think you are, so no forgiveness for you. You do not have that authority. You cannot, as a Christian person, retain anyone's sins and not forgive them. Your obligation is only to forgive Allah, Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. That's the duty of the Christian. The duty of the church is to forgive all who ask, but to also proclaim the law to those who are unrepentant. And so for the unrepentant, your sins are not forgiven. You need to repent and turn back to the Lord. And that goes into, we'll talk about church discipline later, but that's where you may be heard of excommunication. Ultimately, ultimately, unrepentant sin can end with you being removed from the church, um, uh, ultimately. So that's, a, that's um, authority that Jesus gives to the church there in John 20 and not to individual Christians. So, Martin Luther says, you can be just as valid and certain when the pastor says your sins are forgiven as if Jesus is saying it himself. All right? Cool. Well, we need to quit here. I'm uh, tired and <laughs> nine or ten sessions to go. We should be all done. This is what I'd like you to do. So, uh, you guys are Christians. You've been in the church. I want you to... Uh, besides these, uh, besides these little uh, little things here mm -hmm. that says what to read in your catechism, I explained that on the video also, Debbie. Okay. So, so you're like way behind. But um, besides reading these, this is what I would like you to do for the next session. I would like you to read part six because I think you know everything in part six. So I would like to just hit the highlights of part six, these two pages. <clears throat> I would also like to. I'd also like you, oh, uh, I don't know, no, uh, I would be okay with this. Why don't you read part six and part seven okay. and, and part eight, and we'll hit the highlights, but I, but I think we could, I think we could go through it a little quicker if you just read part six, seven, and eight. Okay.
Um, and it's all stuff that you should know because you've been Christian. I mean, mm. we don't, uh, we, uh, six, seven, and eight are really no different um, among denominations because uh, uh, you believe these things or you're not a Christian, ultimately. All right? Okay. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, plan on next Thursday, I think. And Otter and I are going to be out of town next Thursday. Oh, you're out of town yeah. next Thursday. The following week when we're back, we'll... Is uh, there another day next week? I'm at, uh, I fly you're Saturday gone. morning and I'll be back. The following oh, gone. weekend. Yeah. All right, so the following Thursday would work. Yeah. Let's just do that. Can we so skip, skip a week? Skip a week. Skip a week. Okay. We're not in a big rush. Um, I mean, I want you guys to receive the Lord's Supper sooner than later, but... Um, I so, mean, um... God works through the Word, too. With the fuzzing that's going on in my head, what day are we talking about? I have no idea. Okay. It'd be Thank you. Thursday the fifteenth, is it? That could that could be right. August. Um, well, I was way off on that. It's oh the eleventh. Yeah, 11th. We're skipping the fourth. Okay. And we'll do it the eleventh. All right. Okay. Awesome. I I, I, I need dates and, and You got it. Because. Yeah, well, and if you show it. up and nobody's here. Oh well, yeah. I uh, I. Uh, I actually did that uh, after the 